And now the real reason that you tuned in tonight is that um, Eric Reuter has joined us. And now Eric is by trade, if I understand correctly, a, a geologist um, and by training, but um, in the few conversations I've had with him, you know, it's been revealed that he's actually, he's just, he knows a lot about everything. So um, one of the things that he does, and, and he'll tell you more about this, is um, creates amazing models of real actual steamboats that worked on the Missouri River and, and other places too, I believe. So he's gonna share some of what he's learned about the specific boats that, that he's created models for. He's gonna show us some of those models um, and also some of what he's learned about the impact that, um, that steamboats had on not only um, the imagination of the culture that grew up along the Missouri River, but like the actual landscape of the river itself and how um, steamboats actually shaped that landscape. So Eric, thank you so much. Um, he's joining us from his house um, where the internet is okay. It's pretty good. So um, hopefully this is gonna work. I know this is gonna work great. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, Eric. Um, I'm gonna shut up so people will see your picture and get to see what you're sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let me know when it's switched over here. Am I, alive? Am I on now? Steve, am I am I on now? Do you have me switched over? Did you unmute? Steve, can you clarify that you can that everyone can see my opening slide before I get started? Yes. We are seeing it, man. Um, sorry, it took me a while to find my mute button. Looking good. Okay, so steamboats are a really unique aspect of the history of the American West, in part because they largely developed in place. Unlike, say, wagons or railroads that arrived in the West already kind of fully formed, steamboats developed here and really had to adapt to a lot of local conditions. So tonight I'm going to draw on my history of researching and building fairly accurate scale models of Missouri River craft and other vessels to talk about how the landscape of the Missouri River Basin and the Western River Basins in general shaped steamboat development, and also how the actual application of these steamboats in turn shaped the landscape that encompasses the Missouri Basin and the broader West. So I'm going to do this, especially with a focus on two specific models. And these are of two of the more famous Missouri River steamboats we have, the Arabia and the Bertrand, partly because these are the only two steamboats to ever be fully excavated along the river in modern times. I do have the models here with me tonight. After the talk, we can potentially switch over to a cell phone camera and kind of take a closer look at those. But during the talk, we're just going to use pre-ranged images. So I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Quick look at both of these vessels because they're so important to the history of this basin. The first one is the Bertrand. This was built in 1864, sank about a year later near Omaha. It was excavated in the late 60s by a team of National Park Service archaeologists. And the beauty of this is that they made extremely detailed drawings of everything they found. So when I built the Bertrand model, I was able to actually build the hull with open framing, mimicking the actual framing of the vessel. And this was a really neat insight into how these vessels were actually built from the very first timbers up. And so a couple photos here, you can see the fully framed hull of the Bertrand. This model took about 11 months to build, part-time work. And I built it at a scale that converted the 160 foot one boat down to about 26 inches. Now the other boat is Kansas City's own Arabia, which was built in 1853, sank a few years later, just north of what's now Kansas City. And this was excavated in 1988 by a private venture. And the difference here is that this was not an archeological expedition. So there was a lot less detailed notes taken on things like the hull design. 
So the Rabia model is a lot more speculative based on what it might look like because we don't have any photographs, plans, or known information about the Rabia other than what was pulled out of the out of the mud. So this one was a lot more based on personal research and artist license on what it might have looked like and based on imagery that the museum had. This one took 31 months to build, again part-time, and it's about the same size as the Bertrand in real life, but I built it at a larger scale to allow for more detail. So this one's about 34 inches long, you get a sense of the scale here, and uh, bonus points to anyone who can recognize where on the river that picture is taken. So there's a lot of limitations on research into Western River steamboat design. One of them is that early photography is rare. Photography really didn't come into broad use until the Civil War era and afterward, especially out here on the frontier. So it's pretty uncommon to find photographs, and especially to find photographs that show details. Most of the ones we have are kind of broad river shots showing the boat overall, but people really weren't taking photographs of the engines, of inside the hull, of the detailed workings and design of these. Very few construction photos were taken, so there's not a lot of resources to go on. We almost never have plans of these boats. These were not built from blueprints. They were built by hand by small yard craftsmen. There were hundreds of yards that built these things, each doing it their own way. And so this means we don't have a lot of drafts to work from. This wasn't a centralized planning situation where there was a government steamboat design. There wasn't a, a Henry Ford with a steamboat factory mass producing these. Uh, this stands in contrast to, for example, if you're interested in Napoleonic naval history, the British Navy built a lot of their naval vessels from admiralty plans and yards that would churn out, you know, 10 or 20 of the same design of vessels. We have absolutely detailed construction plans for many sailing vessels of this same period, but we don't have that for steamboats, and I'm going to go into that a little more detail later on. Further, a lot of these wrecks are deeply buried. Um, there's some photographs here of excavating the Arabia, and you can see just how deep down in this river sediment this thing is. They're hard to find and they're hard to get to. In a lot of cases, the wrecks are gone. Uh, historically, there's probably a steamboat wreck location every few miles along much of the Missouri, but most of the wrecks were just washed away, may have been salvaged at the time, or just buried under 40 feet of mud. So there's just very been very few recovered, and we don't have a lot of in-place information. And finally, there's not much preservation above the main deck. As we'll talk about soon, the superstructure of these vessels, the part above the main deck, was very flimsily built, and the river tended to wash it away right away when these things went down. So at most, we tend to have heavy things like the wheels and the boilers and the engines and some of the main hull. And for example, on the left, you can see the only piece of the Arabia's hull that we still have, the rest is still in the mud where it was left. And so I really, you really have to work on extrapolating from a few dig photos and other information that we have, but also makes a lot of fun. So I'm going to back up briefly and talk about rivers as travel corridors. Now, we know that in North America, Native American societies were often organized around our major rivers, like the Mississippi River Basin. And throughout most of human history, river travel has been done by muscle and wind. That is the technology we had in play. For example, when Lewis and Clark ascended the Missouri River in the early 1800s, they used this vessel. This is an early model I built of what is commonly called their keelboat. Uh, more accurately, it's really a barge if you're into naval architecture, but keelboat's what most people call it. But this vessel, muscle and wind, that's how they went up the river. And really, that's no different than what the Vikings were doing a thousand years ago when they were sailing and rowing from Scandinavia to Constantinople across Eastern, river, Eastern Europe's river valleys. So really, we hadn't changed at all the way we traveled rivers by the time Lewis and Clark came along. But is there a better way? And you know the answer to that because you're watching this talk. So the natural question is, who invented paddle boats? Where, how did we go from muscle and wind to paddle boats? And if I was doing this in person, I'd ask for some audience feedback, and people would almost certainly guess Industrial Revolution Europe. But note that I said paddle boat, not steamboat. So for paddle boats, the answer is actually 4th to 5th century Roman China. This idea has been around for a long, long time. So here is an image from a Roman military treatise in which someone was speculating on the use of an ox-powered paddle boat for use in the Roman Empire. And this never really got off the drawing board, so to speak, because the Roman Empire didn't really have a lot of major rivers that this would be functional on, and the Mediterranean Sea really isn't practical for this kind of vessel for reasons that I don't have time to go into. So they were thinking about it, but they never really tried it. The Chinese, on the other hand, did it. This is a Qing Dynasty inscription of a much earlier human-powered paddle boat. They were built and used these on major Chinese rivers, and it is just absolutely fascinating to me to think about the Chinese running human-powered paddle boats, you know, a millennia or something before 
we think of paddle boats being used on North American rivers. So this idea has been around, but really this is still muscle. This is human or animal muscle and the technology doesn't really change. What changes it is adding steam. So we first start seeing steam being applied to vessel propulsion. It's a little uncertain when this happened. You can, depends on who you read. It might've been as early as the early 1700s. Certainly by the early 1800s, it was being tested successfully in Scotland. A lot of Americans have heard of Robert Fulton in New York, who had the first commercially successful steamboat operation. By 1812, there was a steam-powered vessel on the Mississippi River operating out of New Orleans. That's the image on the right here. But at this point, the early steamboats were really designed for very tame conditions, calm rivers like the Hudson and the Lower Missouri that weren't that much different from a big lake. But steamboats quickly started to penetrate up the more rugged rivers of the Upper Mississippi and so on. At that point, we're introducing a new technology into a very new and different environment. By 1819, the Independence was operating on the Missouri River. By 1832, the steamboat Yellowstone, which is shown at the bottom, had actually reached the Yellowstone River in western Montana. So very quickly, these vessels were penetrating up into these entirely new terrains and entirely different navigational settings. So what we really want to know is, how do these vessels have to adapt from their early form to deal with the really unusual challenges of the Western rivers? So when I say Western rivers, what are we talking about? This is basically a commonly ter used term to refer to the American frontier from you know, 1812 to about 1900. This is the period when the United States was expanding from the Appalachians from the Appalachians west to the Rocky Mountains. And when navigation was transferring from north to south from New Orleans up to the upper rivers. And so this is a really unique setting to start to adapt river boats to. And one of the challenges here is there are highly variable river and basin conditions. The Mississippi River is different from the Ohio River is different from the Missouri River is different from the Arkansas River. So these vessels had to really adapt to different conditions as they explored and spread throughout these basins. And in doing this, steamboats evolved into a lot of different niches. Uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to use a somewhat biological, ecological analogy here, looking at steamboats as a species adapting to its environment. And it was able to make this really broad adaption to different river basins because, as I mentioned earlier, steamboats were the product of individual innovation, not central planning. And so what happened was river pilots took early boats out, experienced the river basins, came back to the individual builders and said, hey, we, this isn't working, we need to try this. People learned lessons early on on the Ohio River. They applied that to the Mississippi. They applied that to the Missouri. And there was just this absolute ferment of intellectual and engineering innovations, figuring out how to make an entirely new type of vessel work in this entirely new type of navigational environment. And this involved rapid developments in things like propulsion and hull design and operational style. This is just really fascinating. I don't have time to go fully into the full history of steamboat design tonight. That's a wholly different talk. So what I'm going to do is use this ecological analogy to, to define a sort of type species of Western River steamboat. We're going to define the kind of the things that make a Western River steamboat what it is in the way that we might say we recognize this bird as a hawk. And then there are multiple different species of hawk within within hawks. And I'm specifically going to then focus in on what makes the riverboat a distinct subspecies of these sort of western riverboats. When we say western rivers, again, we're talking about essentially the Mississippi River Basin during the period of westward expansion. Now, in order to do this, in order to understand what made steamboats so distinct, we need to back up a little and understand very briefly some of the things that made a typical sailing vessel the open ocean during this period. And this is, again, the topic of a whole other talk, so I'm just going to try to keep this simple. But sailing vessels of this period were designed to deal with conditions in the open ocean, wind and waves. So here is a representative example from another model I built. And we're going to use this to look at some of the features that makes a sailing vessel what it is. And the first one is a heavy, rigid hull. These vessels are operating in the open ocean. They're dealing with lots of, wa lots of waves, lots of stress on the hull. And so these were built of heavy oak with thick timber, a very big, beefy frame. These are meant to be rigid so they can deal with the pounding of waves and the pounding of marine conditions. Another difference is these boats tended to have curved shapes. Now, a curved hull is actually a little more tippy. It's not as stable, but it's kind of necessary in an open ocean setting because these vessels are propelled by wind. 
with tall masts and large sails. And you need the boat to be able to heel, to lean over with the pressure of that wind. And so you need it to be able to rock back and forth. And again, in, in large wave conditions, you actually need the boat to be able to move around side to side in those wave conditions as we tend to have a curved shape to the hull. These boats tend to have a deep draft, and that just means that a lot of the hull is below the water. The hull extends very deeply below the water. And they tend to have a keel, which is some kind of vertical projection below the hull, that helps hold the vessel steady against the pressure of the wind. If anyone's ever taken a canoe, different kinds of canoes out, you may be familiar with the difference between a canoe with a keel that won't skid sideways in the wind, but it does hit bottom of the creek, and a canoe without a keel that doesn't is great for a shallow river, but will skid sideways like crazy in the lake. And all this is based on the conditions of waves and wind in the open ocean. Uh, sailing vessels tend to carry their cargo below deck. Again, we have these big, open, rigid hulls, and we really want the center of gravity as low as possible because these are very top-heavy vessels. So all the cargo is going down below. Passengers are down below. Cargo is down below. Everything is below deck for the most part. And the final thing I'm going to point out is that steering on a typical sailing vessel is on the main deck near water level at the stern. And the primary reason for this is that... The primary reason for this is that Managing a sailing vessel, you're not so concern, concerned with exactly where you're going because you're on the open ocean. You're concerned with how the wind is interacting with your sails. And you need to be at the stern of the vessel to see how to set the sails and to give orders. It doesn't do you any good to be at the front of the vessel because then you can't see the sails. So that's a, that's a you know, course in marine design in a couple minutes. But let's compare what this vessel looks like to what a typical Western River steamboat looks like. So here, uh, upper photo is the hull of the Bertrand, and the lower photos are the Arabia and a, and a kind of typical cross-section. Now, a steamboat in the Western Rivers is dealing with the exact opposite conditions as an ocean-going vessel. We're dealing with narrow, shallow, winding river channels. It's a completely different setting. So if you look at the hull of the Bertrand, these things tended to be framed in much lighter wood, much less bracing. They're actually quite flexible. This hull of the Bertrand could actually flex a couple of feet in any direction. It could slither over sandbars in a way that would absolutely break the back of a sailing vessel. And they're built lightweight. So we have these light, flexible hulls, the opposite of a sailing vessel, so that we could navigate in shallow water and we wouldn't break the back of the vessel when it inevitably struck bottom. We have a rectangular hull cross-section. This is actually a little more like a canoe uh, in the sense that rectangular hulls are actually very stable as long as you're not dealing with too much waves. Once the waves get too high, this is actually a very problematic design, but in a river system where waves aren't a big deal, that rectangular hull is actually quite stable. This is why barges are built this way. This is why many canoes are built this way, because it's very stable up to a point. And notice that these have a very shallow draft. They, some steamboats only drew a couple feet of water, literally only a couple feet of water in this entire vessel would allow this thing to navigate. And they tended to have no external keel. There's nothing sticking down below the hull to snag on the bottom. All the framing is inside. This is very, very different and allows these boats to operate on shallow rivers. Steamboats also tended to carry their cargo, some in the hull, but a lot of their cargo could be carried above, above the waterline. It's off, often on the main deck. In fact, I'm not going to go down this road too far, but you can find photos of lower Mississippi River steamboats with cotton bales piled 30 to 40 feet above waterline on the deck. It's a very different way to carry cargo. And again, this is because the hulls absolutely have to be shallow to deal with river conditions. And the steering on these is in a completely different place. If you look at these vessels, you'll see that small little structure at the very top toward the bow. That's called the pilot house. That's where the pilot is. That's where the steering wheel is. That's where all commands are given from. And it's placed up there because in this case, navigation, instant navigation is the most important point. You need to see the river channel. You need to see obstructions over. You need to be able to see exactly where you're going. So unlike any sailing vessel, steamboats had to place that steering in a completely different location to allow you to make the command decision necessary on a river. In this case, you don't care where the wind is coming from. That's not part of your propulsion. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the features that distinguish this entirely new type of vessel from anything that's come before for thousands of years of human maritime history. Now, there are two basic designs of these vessels, and pretty much everyone has heard of these, but I'm going to talk briefly about why you might choose one or the other. On top, we have a side wheeler. This has a wheel on either side of the hull. This is the Arabia under construction. On the bottom, we have a stern wheeler, and this puts one big wheel at the back of the hull. Now, a side wheeler has certain advantages. Each of those wheels has a separate engine and can be run independently from one another. 
so they're actually quite maneuverable in any given place because you can put one wheel in forward, one wheel in reverse, and you can actually spin these things almost in place. The hulls also tend to be wider and it gives you more cargo capacity. Side wheelers tended to be used on the lower Mississippi River because they're bigger, bulkier, broader, and really good for bulk cargo. The downside to these is that they are tend to be heavier, so they're not quite as good for shallow rivers, and the wheels are also prone to a lot more damage because any debris coming down the river is going to get deflected by the bow right along the sides of the hull and right into those paddle wheels. So they're really kind of a problematic design if you're in a river with a lot of debris and obstacles because the paddles really aren't protected. Now the stern wheeler is basically the opposite. These boats tended to be thinner, lighter, shallower draft. They're good for upper rivers. That wheel in the back is really protected. It's a lot harder to damage that wheel hitting a sandbar or hitting debris because it's protected back there at the end of the boat. The hulls are narrower. So these tended to be featured in shallower upper rivers. It just gives you a sense of why you might choose one design or the other. And both both could be operated almost anywhere, but there, there are some patterns that tended to happen depending on where you were going and what you were doing with these vessels. So really briefly, let's just look at the deck layout of these vessels because it's very, very different from a sailing vessel. You have your shallow hull. You can store hard cargo in that hull, but it's nowhere near the entire shape of the vessel the way it is in a sailing vessel. On the main deck, just above waterline, and that main deck could be only a foot above the water, you have things like heavy machinery, your boilers, your engines, your wheels. This is also where much of the cargo was carried. This is also where low-paying deck passengers were carried. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. On the next deck up, we have the cabin passengers. This is a much nicer way to travel. There's a central public cabin running down the middle. You have your own private cabin with bunks. You have better sanitation. Uh, paying for cabin passage meant you were getting room and board for the length of the voyage, which could be weeks to even months. Some steamboats had an extra layer of cabins above this that were used for the crew. Some didn't. And at the top, you have the pilot house where the steering happens. Now, to return to passengers for a minute, it's important to understand that the two passenger layouts, cabin passenger and deck passenger, really reflected the class realities of travel at this time. If you were wealthy enough to afford cabin passage, this was the way to go. If you weren't, traveling on the deck of a steamboat was a horrific experience. It was dirty. It was crowded. There was no privacy whatsoever. There was very little sanitation. Uh, imagine being a woman with a family traveling for weeks or months to the frontier, crammed in among the cattle and the machinery and the deckhands with nothing clean. These uh, deck passage was associated with disease commonly. Cholera outbreaks were quite common on Western River steamboats. And this is, if you were a slave, this is where you traveled under even worse conditions. So if you were an immigrant family, this is almost certainly where you were. So it's worth considering that although these things are very, they look very romantic and very neat, the reality was much harsher if you were actually on board, especially in deck passage. And we're going to come back to the disease question later in the talk because that ends up being rather important. Really briefly, let's look at how these things were driven. Now, the propulsion technology of a steamboat is, again, an entire talk in and of itself, so I'm just going to visit it really briefly here. But in essence, you have boilers that burn wood to create steam, that feed steam engines, that turn wheels. Now, this, again, is the Arabia under construction when the machinery is still visible, but not buried under the rest of the superstructure. In this case, it's a side wheeler. You can see there's two separate engines, one feeding each wheel. If this were a stern wheeler, it would be basically the same layout, only there would be a single wheel at the very back of the vessel and the steam lines would run from the boiler much farther back. But otherwise, it's basically the same idea. So if you can see the detail here now, you basically load a ton of wood into the front of that firebox. And we're going to talk about wood consumption later on because these things absolutely ate wood. But just pause for a minute to consider the fact that these boilers had to run day and night Imagine being the deckhands whose job it was to feed these boilers day and night in the heat of a Western River summer, whether it's down in Mississippi or whether it's out in the plains. This was a hellish job. It was often the only job open to African-American deckhands, and it was not pleasant. Just give a thought to the people who had to make this thing work. Now, from that fire, you're drawing up cold river water. That river water is heated by the flames, turns into steam, and then again runs back and turns that wheel. Now, just for interest, because... Machinery is hard to see on the finished models. Here's a couple photos of the Arabia's actual machinery. Above left, we see the actual engines on their actual wooden support blocks. You can compare that to the model version. Lower left, we have the boilers in the original wreck position next to the model boilers. You may notice a complicated bit of machinery on the left side of the boiler. That pump system was what made 
using river water possible. And that's another whole talk, but the development of that pump was one of the key innovations that made Western River steamboats possible in summer. But there's a whole lot of detail here that is part of what made these vessels a completely unique and new form of transportation that we'd never seen before anywhere else in the world. So one of the really big engineering problems that had to be solved in designing and building hulls like this was that of hogging. Now, hogging refers to a hull's tendency to deform under its own weight. This is something that sailing vessels had to deal with, and it was generally dealt with by making the hulls very heavy and rigid and bracing them like crazy. That works fine in the open ocean where weight isn't a problem. It doesn't work in shallow rivers where the hull cannot be heavier, you're going to strike bottom. So on a side wheeler, the weight of the engine of the wheels is hanging off the side of the vessel. That's basically pulling the vessel apart down the middle. On a stern wheeler on the right, all the weight is way off at the stern. Imagine the leverage that wheel and engine is creating on this 160 or 200 foot long boat. Again, trying to crack it right in the middle. There has to be a way to stabilize these long, thin, lightweight hulls that doesn't make them so heavy or so rigid that they can't handle river conditions. And again, here's some model photos. Just think about on the Arabia, think about the weight of that gigantic wheel hanging off the side of the vessel. And on the Bertrand on the right, just think about the weight of the engines and wheel hanging off the back of that vessel. We've got to stabilize this somehow. So how do we do it? The answer was another invention that was developed in this bait, in this area for these Western River steamboats, and it's called hog chains. This is a misleading name because they're actually iron rods, not chains. But what they do is redistribute the weight and the strain across the vessel. On a side wheeler, you run these iron rods from the very outer edges of the vessel in, into the middle of the vessel, and this basically pulls up on the outer edge and distributes that weight back into the center of the vessel. On a stern wheeler, they run stem to stern, again, pulling up on all that weight at the end and redistributing it back into the middle of the vessel. If you've ever seen a railroad bridge with a bunch of triangular trusses holding that railroad bridge up, this is the same engineering principle. But the genius here was to do it not with large, heavy, permanent trusses, but with thin iron rods that didn't weigh a lot, but were strong enough to support the vessel. So here's some photos from the models. On the lower left, you see the Arabia's sideways. This is an iron rod that's pulling up on the side of the vessel and pulling that weight into the middle. And on the right, you see the Bertrand's longitudinal hog chains, again, long lines running and pulling all the way to that stern wheel and pulling it back into the middle of the vessel. One other detail I'll point out, look at the Arabia photo. On that hog chain, you'll see a little black thing, thicker thing on that iron rod. That's a turnbuckle. These were actually adjustable. You could turn that turnbuckle and tighten or loosen these iron rods. And that was another innovation, unlike the rigid trusses that had been used in engineering previous to this, that allowed steamboats to be adjusted en route to, is the hull weakening, is getting tighter. You can actually adjust these things and that makes the steamboats much more flexible in operation when you're a long way from any repair yard. So, Based on some of these ideas, we have a basic idea of what constitutes a Western River steamboat, something that might be operating on the Ohio or the Mississippi or the Missouri. But within that basic species, there's a lot of variations on a design, what we might call subspecies. So in the lower Missouri River, you might have these huge floating palaces that are often what the public thinks about when they think about steamboats. Like the city of New Orleans, this is a huge heavy boat with lots of decks. It's designed for the big calm lower river. The opposite of that is something like the Far West here on the right, which is a very small, lightweight, rugged, kind of cut down to the bare bones steamboat with only a couple of feet of draft. That whole vessel can sail in a couple of feet of water. And that's something you might see in the upper Missouri River. So we're gonna transition now to talk about some of the river conditions that might make you need to develop all these different variations on a basic design. So this is a basic graph that presents just two of the many, many different aspects that affect river conditions throughout the West. So are the rivers shallow or deep? And by shallow, I mean anything down to a foot or two of water. And by deep, we could be talking anything 60, 70 feet of water under your, under your hull. And then is the riverbed mostly sediment or is there a lot of rock in it? And a sediment riverbed is one that's going to be bouncing around a lot. It's going to be eroding its banks constantly, changing its channel constantly, because there's no real control on where the river goes. A rocky bed river may still have sediment and gravel in it, but there's a lot more bedrock underneath that's kind of keeping the channel in place and making the river more stable and also creating some rock barriers. So let's think about some examples of rivers that fit some of these. Oops. So a deep and sediment-based river would be the lower Mississippi. And by lower Mississippi, we usually mean south of the Ohio River, south of Carroll, Illinois. 
And from there down in New Orleans, there's really no rock on the river. It's all sediment, and the channel is very, very deep. You're not likely to run aground in the lower Mississippi. The exact opposite of that is a shallow, rocky river. And this would be something like the Ohio River or the upper Mississippi, which actually have quite a bit of rock in, in the river basin. Um, some of, Many of you may have heard of the Falls of the Ohio near Louisville, and this was actually a navigational barrier for quite a while with steamboats because there's a big rock ledge right across the river. The Mississippi River from St. Louis on upwards actually has a whole series of bedrock ledges that constrain the river channel, hold it in place, and were actually navigational barriers. So steamboats had to be able to contend with these sort of shallow rocky conditions. Now the shallow sediment river is the one we're going to focus on from now on, the Missouri River. From St. Louis up to western Montana, there is essentially no bedrock in that river. Thousands of miles of river and there is no bedrock there. It's all sediment. And that is a very unique and distinct navigational environment that steamboats had to adapt to. There really aren't any examples of rocky and deep rivers in the western river basins, so that's something we're just going to leave alone. So from now on, let's talk about the Missouri River now that we've got our background. So navigation on the Missouri River presented a very unique set of challenges. Most of the barriers to navigation were present on other rivers, but they were present in full on the Missouri and often more severely. And given this, it's absolutely amazing to think that steamboats could navigate from St. Louis all the way up to Fort Benton in western Montana at the foot of the Rockies and did so regularly for decades. They even made it up the Yellowstone and the Bighorn Rivers. It's absolutely spectacular that we could design something that could do this. Given that the Missouri River had a ton of challenges to getting anything up that river. One is shallow water. Missouri tends to be very, very shallow, especially as you went upstream. By the time you're in Montana, you're talking about a couple feet of water in the river, and that's something that you've got to be able to deal with. The Missouri River tended to have multiple channels. This is very different from the modern river, and we'll come back to this, but this is called the Braiding River. Lots of different channels. They're constantly shifting, constantly recombining. It's not at all clear which channel you need to follow in many cases. The river is absolutely chock full of sandbars and woody debris. Now, the sandbars come from this being a sediment choked river. There's sediment everywhere. It's shallow. Steamboats were always running onto shallow sandbars blocking the channel. In the same vein, because there's so much sediment, the riverbanks are always eroding and caving in and dumping trees into the river. Steamboats routinely had to deal with the hazards of very large trees floating down the river, impacting the hulls. There were times when you could get woody debris blocking the entire channel. There are stories of steamboat crews having to stop for days to cut and hack their way through entire rafts of dead trees blocking the entire river. We talked about loose banks. Um, this was actually a danger. There were cases where, loot, where high banks actually collapsed onto or near steamboats and created real navigational hazards. Missouri was also particularly prone, prone to extreme flow variations. All rivers go up and down with the seasons, but the Missouri is draining the arid high plains, but also the snow melt of the Rocky Mountains and the tendency of the plains to have extreme thunderstorms. And so almost any conditions from raging floods two nearly dry rivers could be encountered on this river more so than in the other rivers. Now, relative lack of fuel is another one. Steamboats burned wood in this era. And if you think about the ecology of the plains, wood becomes a more and more precious resource as you go up river. And we're gonna talk more about this in a little bit, but just consider how much harder it is to run a wood guzzling boat the further you get up into the plains and away from the more wooded Eastern US, unlike again, the Mississippi or the Ohio. High winds were a particular danger. The plains are known for high winds, and the river really wasn't all that protected from this for the most part. So you've got these boats with two, three, four stories of superstructure, and what happens when the winds hit these boats? That, that's a real navigational problem that, again, wasn't quite as big a deal on more eastern rivers. And finally, ice. All rivers have ice in the spring, but the Missouri was, again, particularly prone to large ice jams and ice flows coming down from the frozen plains and becoming a real navigational hazard. And there are copious quotes and accounts of just how dangerous and frightening and problematic Missouri River navigation was, but I'm going to use this one quote to capture all. This is from a Jesuit priest who had the dubious experience of traveling Missouri by steamboat, and he said that steam navigation on the Missouri is one of the most dangerous things a man can undertake. I fear the sea, but it did not inspire me with so much terror as the navigation of the summer, treacherous, muddy Missouri. I hope that captures something of the challenges to navigating on this particular basin. So how did steamboats adapt to this, this unique set of challenges? Well, the first thing they did was pilots quickly learned that stern wheelers were preferred. 
And we talked about this, but stern wheelers are less prone to damage from debris in the river. They tend to be lighter. It tends to be easier to get over and across sandbars. They're just all, and they're narrower. They're just all about better for these kind of shallow, narrow rivers. So very quickly, this became the dominant style in the upper Missouri. Boats also evolved to have a low profile strupa structure. Notice in all the photos here, these are not the big towering castles of the lower Mississippi. These are all very low vessels, very small decks. The general mead on the lower right there is an extreme example of this where there's almost nothing above the main deck at all. And this helped keep the weight of the boat down, it helped keep the effect of the winds down. Another was the development of what's called the spoonbill bow. Now earlier steamboats tended to have a kind of sharply pointed, kind of traditionally maritime bow, the idea being they would cut through the water. But on really shallow set of rivers, it was found that these sharp bows just tended to get stuck in things. They'd stick in banks, they'd stick in sandbars. You needed something different. So the builders actually developed what's called the spoon bill, and it's named this because it's shaped like a spoon held out with the open side up. And this kind of rounded, gentle, smooth bow was much better at riding up over and off of sandbars and quickly became much more competitive. You can kind of see the shape of this on the general mead at the lower left. You just get the sense that's a very broad, bluff bow. It's, it's, it's not going to win any awards for efficiency in cutting through the water, but it's far better at getting over sand. And the last thing I'm going to point out is probably my single favorite feature of upper river boats. And this is what's called grasshopper spars. And these are the unusual features you might have noticed on the models already. And that you can now see pointing to by orange are These weird big poles hanging off the bow of the vessel. And I'm going to spend a whole slide talking about what these are and how they work because they're complex and absolutely fascinating. So here's a better view from the Arabia of grasshopper spars. And again, these are these big brown wooden poles that are dangling off the side of the boat. And they're hanging from a couple of extra white spars you can kind of see in the right-hand photo there. Now I'm going to put up a diagram of the rigging. To control these takes three different kinds of lines. And don't worry, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm about to show you how these work. But the orange lines control that white boom, how far out that's lowered. And the blue and purple lines raise and lower that grasshopper spar. So understanding that, I'm going to show you an animation of what happens when you use these and what they're for. So let's say you're a Western River steamboat and you've run aground on a sandbar that's blocking the channel and you cannot force your way over it. What do you do? This is where grasshopper spars come in. What we're going to do is take that spar and we're going to drop it down into the river, down into that sandbar. So the first thing I'm going to do is use those orange lines to maneuver the spar out to where I want it. So it's hanging over the river. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let go on that blue line, which is holding the spar up, and that pole is going to drop into the river. So watch this. Okay, that pole now dropped down, and now it's buried deeply in the sandbar. The next thing we're going to do is now haul in on that purple line. And what that's going to do is it's going to pull up on, this, on the spar. And the only thing that can happen here if the spar is buried in the sand is for the boat to rise up onto that spar. This is a lot like someone on crutches pushing up onto the crutches. So here we go. We've tightened that purple line. The boat is now balancing up on the grasshopper spars and it's off the sandbar. Now what do you think we do next? We put the engines in gear, we drive forward, and the boat lurches forward in a motion that again is a lot like a person on crutches. And you do that cycle as often as you need to to get your boat over the sandbar. This could be an absolutely maddening experience for crews. There are accounts of it taking a boat an entire day to spar over a single sandbar. Just tedious as all get out. But this is the only way to navigate these shallow waters. And this was, again, was something that was developed innovatively on the Western rivers to deal with a specific navigational problem that really wasn't encountered anywhere else and dealt with in this way. I just think grasshopper spars are the neatest thing ever as a distinct marker of an upper river boat. These were used in other rivers like the upper Ohio and some other shallow tributaries, but they are absolutely representative of Missouri river boats. So now that we have a sense of how Missouri river boats were designed to go far up the Missouri basin, why would you want to? So let's talk about the economics of steamboat operation briefly and I'm kind of base this on the peak of river operation in the mid 19th century. This was a high risk venture. The construction of a steamboat might cost anywhere from twenty dollars to $25,000 for a fairly small vessel. And that number doesn't mean a lot. It's roughly equivalent to at least half a million dollars in modern numbers. But the point mostly is for comparison with another value I'm going to give you in a minute. But this was a high capital outlay for the time. These had very high operating expenses. These needed constant repair. You had to pay and board the crew for months at a time. 
you had fuel costs. The lifespan of these boats tended to be less than three years. The Missouri River was not welcoming to steamboats. There were wrecks littered along the river. These boats did not last long. Again, very high risk to build and operate one of these things. And this is reflected in the fact that freight insurance rates on the Missouri were at least twice that on the Mississippi or the Ohio, which reflects the uniquely problematic nature of the Missouri River. And finally, this was an era of intense competition and economic uncertainty. This was the frontier capitalism era. Anyone with money could throw it into steamboat competition. So people were building steamboats left and right and throwing them at, at the problem. And so rates, you could have rate wars that could undercut your, your profitability. This is also a period where the economy took wild swings. It went from depressions to boom, from depressions to booms. The Civil War threw a gigantic wrench into the economics of steamboat operation in these basins. So this is just a very uncertain thing to invest your money in. So why would anyone do it? Well, it's also a very high reward activity. This was the period of rapid frontier growth, especially westward along the Missouri River. Steamboats were the supply chain for a huge amount of Western expansion. They carried all sorts of products up the river and all sorts of products down the river. So there was just a massive amount of business to be had. And this is reflected in the fact that freight rates to Fort Benton in Western Montana were four to five times higher than they were to Council Bluffs. People high up the river would pay almost anything to get freight brought to them because there was absolutely no other way to do it. So a single upper river trip, and I mean from St. Louis to Fort Benton to the foot of the Rockies, could net a boat a profit, profit mind you, not gross, a profit of twenty-four dollars to $40,000. Now compare that to the cost of building a boat. A single upper river round trip could pay back your entire investment in an asset that could last three years or maybe 10 years. There are occasional reports of boats that netted sixty dollars to $80,000 in a single trip, up to four times the initial investment. That is an absolutely honey to the B of an, of an invest, venture capitalist at this time. This was where venture capital went, was in the high risk, high reward, pouring money this in the dream you might make this. A lot of people lost their shirts doing it, but boy was that lure of quadrupling your investment in a single trip alluring. Finally, there were government contracts. Steamboats carried government mail, and even more importantly, they carried the U.S. Army. And we're going to come back to this point, but steamboats were a supply chain for U.S. Army operations in the plains for decades. And you could almost argue this is the first instance of the government industrial military industrial complex in which government military investment supported a huge industry that might otherwise not have been competitive because of the sheer amount of work that steamboats did for the U.S. Army in this period. So this gives you a background into why this was taking place. But inevitably, all things come to an end. We're all, I think, familiar with the idea that there are no longer steamboats operating on the river. So why did this happen? The single biggest reason that steamboat declined was railroad competition. Every time the railroad arrived westward of the Missouri River, it undercut steamboat operations. Railroads were simply more direct, more efficient, more reliable. Um, they were all season operators. Steamboats had to shut down in the winter. Railroads could run year round. For in almost every way, railroads were improvement on transportation. And so if you look at the diagram here, these dates are of different points that railroads reached the Missouri River. And what happened was at each of those dates, Riverboat traffic below that point quickly withered because railroads quickly took almost all of the business. And so, again, by the 1880s, steamboats were really only restricted to very upper river operations, to maybe some small town routes for places that didn't have railheads, and then small tributaries like the Osage and Gascony rivers in Missouri. The other factor here was the decline in government contracts. Again, by the late 1880s, by the end of the 19th century, the Plains Indian Wars were over. There wasn't really military contracts anymore. There wasn't, the government wasn't as active here in a way that steamboats could help. And again, railroads were taking the place of this in terms of supply lines. So they're really, all the money flowing into the steamboats went to railroads and even to roads, and they just didn't have a purpose anymore. And so steamboats basically vanished. I do want to make a really quick mention here. Steamboats maintained operation in isolated areas well into the 20th century, into the 1920s and 30s. I want to throw out this absolutely fantastic photo of the Kingfisher, a boat that was built on the Gasconade River roughly 1895. This is representative of the tiny little boats that operated in the Ozarks well into the 1920s. This is supposedly one of the shallowest draft steamboats ever built. This thing could basically run on almost no water, and I just I think this would make a fantastic future modeling project. But look into the history of steamboating on the Gasconade if you want some really cute little steamboats.
So given that overall arc of history, we're in the final part of this talk, we're going to start talking about ways that steamboats affected the basin. We now understand how the basin shaped their design and operation. Let's talk about the reverse. And an absolutely major way that this happened was fuel use. Steamboats were wood hawks. Now, it's really hard to find reliable numbers on how much fuel steamboat use. Real, otherwise reliable and authoritative sources differ wildly in the estimates they give for wood use. There's a huge diversity in steamboat design and size and operational conditions. The smallest estimate that I can find from a reliable source was that the smallest class of upper river boat might be burning 12 to 24 cords of wood a day. Probably refueling twice daily because they're burning so much wood. Now, if you're not a firewood aficionado, a cord of wood is a stack of wood four foot by four foot by eight foot. That's basically a large pickup truck stacked above the level of the cab. That's a lot of wood. In a modern forestry understanding, we estimate that a one tree 22 inches in diameter is about a cord. So we're looking at 12 to 24 trees per day of wood as the lowest end estimate for voyages that could last weeks to months. Now that's not even the worst of it because that's volume, but we're not building this wood with this wood, we're burning it. So how much heat energy is there in the wood that steamboats were using? Now Missouri is known for its oak hickory forest and they make fantastic firewood because they have a lot of heat energy in that wood. The problem is steamboats weren't burning oak and hickory. They were burning wood species that could be found along riverbanks. Oak and hickory is found in the uplands. So steamboats were burning things like cottonwood and sycamore and elm. And at best, these have half to maybe two thirds the heat energy as what we think of as traditional firewood. And certainly as you went further up the Missouri River Basin, and especially once you left Missouri or even Kansas, this is all the wood you have. There is no oak and hickory in the river bottoms of Montana. So you're burning low heat content wood as well as the sheer volume of wood. And I will point out that reputable records suggest that trees, the virgin timber of this era was much larger than trees we see today. There are reliable accounts of cottonwoods that were routinely seven foot in diameter, and certain accounts mention them being 30 foot or more in diameter. So you might be cutting less trees, but give a thought to the poor steamboat crew that was stopping twice a day to cut down seven to 10 foot cottonwoods, buck that into firewood and haul it back to the boat in the heat of a Nebraska summer. Not pleasant. So let's talk about some of the influences that steamboat operation had on the landscape of the Missouri Basin. As the fuel use discussion implies, these were active agents of deforestation. They actively changed the nature of forests along the river. Just try to think about what it meant to have hundreds of steamboats burning tens of cords of wood per day for decades and on voyages that could last for weeks to months. We don't have a good way to envision how much wood that is, but it's extraordinary. Now, Lewis and Clark, when they went up to the Missouri in the early 1800s, noted richly timbered bottoms almost throughout the landscape. By even in Missouri, they were still praising the rich timber resources available for future settlement. Those resources are mostly gone today. You said even in Missouri. Those resources are mostly gone today. And where they've regrown, the timber is far smaller. So we don't have seven, seven to ten foot cottonwoods anymore. Um, this is this is widely known through a lot of North America that the regrown timber is never as high quality or as large as the virgin timber that was left behind. So I'd really love to do a proper GIS study of how this might work, of what how much landscape actually might have been deforested by steamboat operation. But just as a conceptual question, it's a really fascinating idea to think about what these boats were actively doing to the landscape. They were also the drivers of early sediment. Long before railroads came into play, steamboats were the supply lines for settlement throughout the Missouri River Basin. They expanded access to the frontier in a way that was far more efficient than wagons, and they created transportation lines that both shipped the necessary supplies up to frontier towns and settlements and shipped agricultural products back. For example, the Arabia Museum refers to the Arabia as a floating Walmart of the 1850s because its cargo was almost entirely everyday bulk goods that settlers wanted but really weren't economic to haul up by wagon. So steamboats also accelerated the conversion to farmland of the prairies and woodlands that were previously there. And this is not only because they drove settlement, but because they also created an easy way to ship products back out. For just one example, in central Missouri, very early on, central Missouri became a, the most highly, sorry, central Missouri became a slave plantation dominated part of Missouri, shipping out large, 
egg products like tobacco and cotton and hemp that were best grown by slave labor. To this day, this region is known as Little Dixie because it took on many of the uh, characteristics of the lower Mississippi and having these bulk plantations. And the reason that was possible was because steamboats were there to carry those products to market. No one was going to be floating bulk cotton down by raft. So steamboats made it possible as navigation expanded up the river for farms to expand beyond subsistence to production for sale. And that really accelerated land conversion throughout the basin. And finally, steamboats allowed the founding of many early cities along the river. Without steamboats, we wouldn't have Bismarck, Pier, Omaha, Council Bluffs. A lot of these cities later became the railheads that railroads built to, but they were there because of steamboats. If steamboats had not been able to navigate up the river, those cities might not have been founded or might have been founded in different places. We might not have had a place for railroads to build to. So it's a really interesting question of what this region might have looked like if we hadn't, if people hadn't really begun to reach this area until the railroads came along. Finally, uh, steamboats had a major effect on the nature of the Missouri River itself. We briefly talked earlier about how the original natural river basin was a shallow, multi-channel, very dynamic river that was constantly overflowing its banks, getting into its floodplain, changing its channels. That has all changed. The modern Missouri River is a single channel. It's deep. It's regulated. It doesn't change its course. It, it rarely overflows its banks, except in extreme floods. It's an utterly different beast. And that change was made to abet navigation. This was something that was long advocated by steamboat interests, particularly when the railroads came along, because one of the reasons that railroads were able to outcompete steamboats was the inherent danger and unreliability of navigating the river. So steamboat interests and merchants along the upper river clamored for government intervention to clean up the river, to take the snags out, to stabilize the channel. The irony here is that steamboats basically collapsed as an active method of transportation by the 1880s. We didn't finish channelizing and stabilizing the river navigation until after World War II. So it really wasn't until 50 to 70 years after steamboats collapsed that we finally finished creating a river system that was meant for them. So this has some long-term implications for river management because without steamboats, we probably never would have tried to stabilize the river in the first place. So the river channel you see now and the, nature, the very nature of land use along the river bottoms was created by the fact that steamboats for a brief time were able to navigate that river. Now, I'm going to take just a little bit of time here to talk about what I think is an extremely important point and honestly really should be an entire talk in itself. And that is the impact of steamboat navigation on the Missouri River on Native American cultures in the river basin. And I wish I could spend more time on this. For the most part, steamboat traffic on the river was a disaster for these indigenous cultures. For one thing, steamboats accelerated the pace of European intrusion into their lands. We've already talked about driving settlement but even more so, steamboats drove early extractive industries that moved well ahead of full, full sediment agriculture. Things like trapping became far more advanced when you could ship a boatload of furs down the river. When fur trapping was restricted to canoes, it was a minor activity. When you could load an entire steamboat full of furs and send it down to St. Louis and stay up there trapping, this got a lot more aggressive. Mining was the same way. We didn't really talk about why steamboats wanted to go up to Fort Benton in Montana in the first place. The reason is gold mining. There were some huge gold deposits up there, and steamboats were transporting extraordinary amounts of gold out of that area and transporting all the supplies back up. Without that efficient form of transportation, it's highly unlikely that things like mining and trapping and other extraction would have progressed nearly as fast into those regions as it did otherwise. Steamboat traffic also enabled U.S. Army operations far earlier than might have happened otherwise. Steamboats, as we talked about earlier, were the supply chain for the U.S. Army in the Plains Indians Wars. They made it possible to operate throughout the Plains. And this was a disaster for Plains cultures trying to defend their land. For just one example, Custer's infamous 1876 expedition that ended at the Battle of Little Bighorn was supported by the steamboat Far West that carried supplies and communications and soldiers all the way up the Missouri and as far as the Yellowstone River. In fact, after the defeat, the Far West carried the remainder of the wounded soldiers back out to the nearest fort. So if you're a Plains Indian culture trying to hold on to your land, steamboats made it far easier for your adversary to overwhelm me with the supply chain. Without steamboat navigation, the army simply wouldn't have been able to operate that far from its supply bases. And that changed the arc of history, in my opinion, in the most unfortunate way for if you're a Native American. And finally, and most importantly, 
Steamboats were a disease vector into Native American cultures. I know we mostly understand now that disease was a massive factor shaping the European intrusion into North America. Disease, waves of disease moved far ahead of Maine European settlement and decimated Native cultures throughout the area, with some estimates being up to 90% of population loss before European settlement even really happened. But steamboats were a specific and vibrant vector for this. As just one example, in 1837, a smallpox epidemic that was carried by the steamboat St. Peter, incidentally a fur trading vessel, killed over 17,000 indiv indigenous people. Remember we talked about how deck passage was a very squalid, disease-ridden thing? This smallpox was carried on a deck passenger on the St. Peter. And we say it killed over 17,000 because that's only the number that was officially tallied by European observers. The real number was almost certainly higher, we just don't have census numbers for it. And I'm going to share a quote here that really gets at this. And this is referring only to this one 1837 outbreak. Among the Hidatsas, Arakaras, Assiniboines, and Blackfeet, the disease killed at least half. More tragically, the Mandans were all but destroyed. The Lakotas would migrate into the country left empty by their decimated rivals, setting the stage for the Indian War of the 1860s and 1870s. It feels particularly poignant to point out the role of steamboats as disease vectors in a talk that I have to give on Zoom in the middle of a pandemic that has up overturned global society in so many ways for a disease that is nowhere near as virulent as a smallpox epidemic that could wipe out half to 90% of a culture. And it's almost impossible to overstate the effect this had on native peoples and and how much we don't understand about what how, how land management worked and how these cultures operate in these areas because disease wiped these people out before we really had a chance to re fully respect them. And steamboats were unfortunately a major way this happened. Steamboats acted something like uh, jetliners in this era because they made transportation up these rivers so much faster and could, could carry infected people up the river so much faster than the old muscle and wind version of safe fur trader canoes. So that's just something that I think we really need to keep in mind. As fascinating as steamboats are, they were also an absolute catastrophe for the original inhabitants of this landscape. So with that, I'm going to wind up by pointing out that what I want you to take away from this is that steamboat development and use played an active role in shaping the modern Missouri River Basin. It kind of functioned like an invasive species. Steamboats were introduced to this new environment. They rapidly adapted to it. They filled a bunch of different niches in it. And in the process, they shaped that environment and their effect is still seen today, even after they essentially went, went extinct. So I want you to think about going this, what would the basin look like if steamboats had not been invented or if we had not been able to adapt them to operate on the Missouri River and if they had not been able to penetrate the plains and have all the effects they had. How different would our landscape and our geography and our culture be if this particular technological innovation hadn't happened? So a couple of brief acknowledgments. Uh, thank you for sticking with me through all of this. I want to really briefly thank Carrie Elliott for proposing this talk in the first place and Missouri River Relief for giving me the opportunity to share my ideas here. I want to mention the Arabia and Bertrand Museums, which are absolutely fantastic and you should absolutely go to when travel to something like that becomes a thing you're comfortable doing. The Murphy Library Special Collections at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse hosts an online collection of thousands upon thousands of steamboat photographs. It is absolute candy for any steamboat enthusiast, and I urge you to go look at their collections. And they graciously allowed me to use many of their photos in this. Last thing I want to mention is, in, in terms of the model building, I'm a member of the Nautical Research Guild, which is an international nonprofit that supports research into maritime history, both inland and marine with an emphasis on the use of model building to preserve and interpret that history. And they run an online forum called Model Ship World that has over 38,000 members on every settled continent that is an absolutely fantastic resource for people wanting to learn more about model building, about maritime history, and the way these intersect. And I strongly urge you to go take a look at that if anything I've shown tonight has sparked your interest. And finally, I just want to thank my longtime companion and discovery, my wife, Joanna, for being such a part of my fascination with rivers and river boats. There's a bibliography slide here that I'm not going to leave up because you can, this, this talk will be hosted online and you can go back and look at this later, but these are some resources you can come back and look for later on. With that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and we can start getting into comments. Thank you all for listening and watching. Well, Eric, um, 
this uh, this has been an absolutely amazing talk. I can't believe how much information and really your own kind of unique perspective at drawing all these pieces of information together um, that, that you packed into one hour. I feel like I just read a book about steamboats with um, 15 chapters. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, right now, we've just got a few questions. You know, we've got a really smart audience. So I have a feeling that more will start trickling in. Um, but I'm just going to start. Uh, Jeremy Helton has a couple really great questions. <clears throat> he was wondering, um, you know, and and to the extent that you know, you just you just talked about the importance um, that steamboats had on um, the history of, of Native Americans and Indigenous people in the heart of the Great Plains. Um, you know, kind of another untold story is. Um, I feel like about Missouri River steamboat history is like the role that um, slaves and African Americans played in making the whole system work. Um, and so Jeremy's question was, to what extent was slave labor used on the boats prior to the Civil War? And was the escape risk too great? That's a fascinating question. Um, I'm going to outright say that it's not something I have deep knowledge of and I don't want to get out over my skis. On the Missouri River, my sense is that it would have been fairly rare because for most of the river basins, slavery was relatively uncommon, except in a few counties along central Missouri. Now, in the lower Mississippi, um, you know, slavery is obviously far more widespread and far more used. On the Missouri, it's probably relatively uncommon, but I, I don't know that I want to give a very definitive answer to that. Um, post post Civil War, certainly deckhand jobs were a job that was open to free african-american labor partly because it was a dirty nasty job that many people didn't want to do and unfortunately that created an opening for african-american labor so you can find a lot of accounts of black laborers on steamboats in the post-war era but i'm not sure i can definitively say to what extent slave labor is used on boats my guess would be not all that common just because the people running and operating steamboats weren't necessarily plantation slave owners but again, I think I want to stop there before I get out into a subject area that I'm not fully knowledgeable about. Yeah, um, and I, I do not know a ton about this either, but there is a really excellent book called um, Black Lives on the Mississippi that talks also about the Missouri. Um, and there's just kind of some history that I've come across from the Missouri River as well. And in an interesting, um, painful phenomenon is that, um, and, and not uncommon practice was for plantation slaveholders to actually rent their slaves to steamboat, um, operations to use on board. And so, um, it, this was often used as punishment or, you know, as, or sometimes just as a way to generate more income. Um, so I know that there was to some degree that that definitely happened. Um, and uh, it's obviously a history that needs a lot more digging into and, you know, I'm sure there's actually people who have done a lot of research on it um, that we, we need to find and bring to light for sure. Um, so Jeremy has another question. He mentioned he says that you mentioned the Yellowstone, the Gasconade, and the Osage rivers as navigable tributaries of the Missouri. What were other tributaries that were generally navigable? I would say those are probably the most common ones. Um, I believe the Grand in Missouri had temporary some small town operations on it, but less so. A lot of the Plains rivers, things like the Platte and the Kansas were just so shallow that they really were especially hard to navigate up. And there wasn't much reason to go up there because they basically dead in the plain and nothing there. You know, the reason you went up the Missouri was to reach the mountains and the gold mines and so on. But a lot of the rivers that are draining fully out of the plains in the Missouri just really didn't have a reason for the most part to go up them on any routine basis. There's, you know, I see an example of someone poking around, a steamboat poking around up there, but there just wasn't a reason to do it. Whereas, you know, the Osage and the Gasconade are draining the Ozark terrain where there's a lot of timber products to bring down. There's small farms that aren't served by railroads, for example. 
and were a little more settled early on. So those are rivers that actually had an economy that could drive, you know, navigating a steamboat on. But really, most of the rivers, once you get north of Kansas City, most of the rivers flowing into the Missouri just didn't have a lot of reason to run a steamboat up. And speaking very generally, um, Yellowstone is pretty surprising, honest, because there's not much up there either. But uh, I think in some cases it was even just mil military again the contracts that led some of the navigation of the Yellowstone, like the Far West, and to a certain extent gold, you know, gold mining and so on. Actually, a fascinating side note on there: the Arabia, the Sidewheeler Arabia, supposedly made it all the way up part way up the Yellowstone. That that's an extraordinary voyage for a big sidewheeler to have made it not just up the Missouri but up the Yellowstone. I just I find that mind blowing that that boat got away with that. A lot of them didn't, <laughs> but it's a neat extra history that even the yellow that the Arabia could manage that. That is amazing. That it must have been a high water year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Clinton Stober says, "Great talk." Um, and he just said, "We really enjoyed the diagram of the grasshopper spars, which we're also fascinated by." And I totally agree. I've read about these things a lot, um, and never really was able to visualize how they work. So you, yeah, that, that was awesome. Um, that's a case where I really wish we could have the models in person because it's a lot easier to understand these things when you can look at that, look at them in three dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Rob Jacobson also says great talk. And he's wondering, did steamboats on the Missouri river ever transition to coal? That is an excellent question. And for the most part, the answer is no. Steamboats did transition to coal fuel in general, just the way railroads did. That was most common on the Mississippi and the Ohio. And I would say there's two reasons for that. One, in the Missouri River Basin, coal deposits weren't easily accessible from the river. So there actually are some very large coal deposits, say in Missouri, there's surface coal mining in quite a bit of Missouri. But the coal deposits weren't near the river and weren't necessarily exploited early on enough to really make that a thing, whereas wood was readily, readily available. Um, whereas in say the Ohio River Basin, coal was available much more densely, so at the edge of the Appalachians, just it was, it was more densely settled, so coal was more accessible. Um, another factor is there were some technological changes as there was in railroads shifting from wood burning boilers to coal burning boilers, and by the time that shift really started to take hold, the Missouri River navigation was already kind of declining, so there really wasn't much of a reason to readapt your boats to burning coal. Just think about the supply chain it would take to haul coal up the Missouri all the way up to Montana so it could then be burned by steamboats, right? You'd have to have a whole supply chain, whereas even scarce wood was still there in place. Whereas, you know, with coal, coal can come downriver down the Ohio to supply depots on the Ohio and the Mississippi. But taking a coal burning boat going up the Missouri has to haul its own fuel and other boats fuel all the way up. So it just practically it just didn't really take hold. It's possible that, you know, if, steam, if railroads had never come along and steamboats were only navigation, you know, eventually the big Missouri coal surface mines might have started transporting coal to coal depots on the river, but it just it just didn't work out that way given the timing of other developments. I think that's the best answer I can give there. But yeah, there's a fun geology there. It would be actually fun. I, I kind of left out some theoretical slides on coal deposits in the basin and versus wood deposits in the basin, all that kind of stuff. But the talk was already long enough that I just didn't go there. So sorry, Rob. I, I know we could have had more geology in there, but uh, I had to cut something. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. Um, so Bob Steyer um, is wondering about, um, I guess, sort of the impact of Missouri River flow velocity on boat design. So was there um, something about the the velocity of the Missouri River that might have impacted hull design as well? Um, what I would one thing I'd say is that rudder design changed over time, and this is this gets into the weeds real fast. <laughs> A better style of rudder was developed that was better able to handle conditions on some of these upper rivers. So not necessarily hull design itself but rudder design certainly changed and flow conditions you know flow velocity certainly affected the way boats operated and when they operated and how they operated you know higher higher water meant deeper water so you're not striking sandbars but it also meant debris coming down the river faster and more work churning against that current so you know there's kind of a trade-off a lot of boats would follow boats would follow a spring pulse up the river and that spring snowmelt because the high water meant it was easier to get up the river 
and they'd kind of coast back down the river in the shallow fall when, you know, it was a lot easier to have a sandbar when you're going with the current. But I don't, I don't know that I know of any particular hull, hull shape alterations to do with velocity. It's more of just an operational question, again, to the extent of my knowledge, and there may be a specialist out there that can correct me, but I think it's more a question of rudders and operations and seasonality of how and when you would navigate. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> Bob was also curious if you know, um, like what happened to some of these steamboats after they were retired on the Missouri River? Um, he mentioned that the Yellowstone served as an early Texas capital on a Texas river, which is interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Um, yeah, I've certainly heard stories about, you know, um, homes being built partially from wrecked steamboats. There's, yeah, there's a ton of diverse histories to what happened. A lot of them just, you know, got broken up for scrap. They got, they burned or got broken up or rotted away in the banks, you know, it, especially on the Missouri River, like navigation stayed active on the Ohio and the Mississippi, but it really just kind of died on the Missouri despite various efforts to get barge traffic going. It just never really took off. So yeah, certain boats, like you said, the Yellowstone had a fun second life. Certain ones got repurposed to keep navigating on, on the Mississippi. A lot of them just went away. You know, they were cheaply built. They weren't built to last. They were essentially disposable transportation. You know, they, they were not meant to last. So a lot of them just fell apart. They burned they wrecked, they were given up, um, you know, no one really thought to preserve them because they weren't famous. They weren't, you know, HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship that the British public felt the need to preserve. They weren't the USS Constitution, a famous naval vessel. Most of them were fairly obscure. There wasn't really a cultural sense that these were treasures to be preserved. So for the most part, they just kind of faded away. Um, sure, you know, research can find the individual boat that had a cool second life, but yeah, they mostly just vanished and rotted and burned. <laughs> And a bunch of them are below the river sediment, below farm fields. There's probably a hundred or more beneath the farm fields all along the Missouri that are just down there waiting to be found, but they're hard to find. Yeah, right. Um, and, you know, the story of the Arabia um, <clears throat> and the excavation of that, the finding of it and everything is is pretty fascinating. Um, and, uh, um, for some reason, I'm blanking on the names. You, you remember the name of the family that, um, of the Hollies, I guess, that, that excavated the Arabia and uh, multiple families. I'm sorry. The consortium of multiple families, but yeah, the Arabia Museum website has a good history of how that operation went. For those who want to read up on that, I'd go to the Arabia Museum's website and read up on the history there. Yeah, there's a really great book called Treasure in a Cornfield that was written by one of those guys. Um, so Rebecca Olson was also wondering: Was there any role for women in riverboat culture? and uh, operation. Not that I have seen mentioned, um, particularly on the rougher upper rivers. I would, if anything, traveling on the upper on the Missouri River was probably a pretty hellish experience for women, to be perfectly honest. Um, crew were men, there really wasn't. A lot of these boats had women's cab. If you were a cabin passenger, there were separate areas of the main cabin set aside for women. So you had a modicum of privacy. It was kind of think of a drawing room that gentlemen weren't allowed to enter. So you had, you know, you had your own head, for example, your own restroom. You had a, a bit of privacy, but privacy was still minimal. And that's that's paying cabin passenger. If you were a woman on the main deck, you were out there with everybody else. And I, I'm very few accounts have been left by women. I probably I'd like to spend more time reading through you know, historical journals and things. I haven't spent as much time in the cultural side as on the technological and ecological side. So I'm sure there are resources that I haven't read on the, you know, cultural accounts of what it was like. <clears throat> I will mention that there is a neat book. It's in my bibliography. The name is escaping me. That was written by a woman who was part of a dominant steamboating family on the Missouri and the Osage and the Gasconade, the Heckmans. Dorothy Heckman, I think is her name. And she wrote a really neat book on growing up in sort of the last generation of riverboat men, what that was like to be a part of a riverboat family in a later period. So that's a neat uh, woman's eye account of what it was like to be a part of a riverboat family and stay around the turn of the century and into the tens and twenties. So you can look that one up. But yeah, women, to my knowledge, women didn't serve on riverboats. There wasn't, you know, a female attendant for women passengers and so on. It might be different in the lower Mississippi. A lot of my knowledge is more about the upper rivers and not the sort of floating, you know, rich palaces of the lower Mississippi. On upper river boats, it was rough. You just sort of dealt with it. 
Actually, yeah, another, thank you. Another quick story that does sort of involve women. Steamboat disasters are really common. One of the more famous disasters on the Missouri was near Lexington, Missouri, which is a bit downstream of Kansas City, when a steamer whose name escapes me blew up just outside of town, just absolutely exploded and showered debris across the entire landscape and killed a bunch of passengers. In fact, the boat's safe landed on a bluff outside of town. But that boat was carrying a lot of immigrant families, um, and many of the adults were killed, and there's a lot of orphaned children left from that wreck. And the people of Lexington adopted many, many of those orphaned children and brought them up as their own. So there's a role there for women often in cleaning up the mess left behind by a, by faulty engineering and faulty safety protocols in taking care of wreck survivors and helping with that sort of thing. So there, there's a role there. But on the river, my impression is that it was pretty much a man's world for the most part, unfortunately. Um, kind of to follow up on, on that story, um, Linda Vogt was wondering <clears throat> um, how, you know, you talked about how often steamboats would wreck were the lives of passengers, captains, et cetera, you know, deckhands often lost in these wrecks? I think that's kind of an interesting story that isn't necessarily what you would expect. Yeah, that's a really good question. Interestingly enough, steamboat wrecks for the most part, most part were not particularly deadly with one major exception. But when most steamboats were wrecked, it was usually because they hit something. They hit a snag in the river, they hit a sandbar and the hull broke open. Most of the time when they sank, they went down fast, but the river was shallow, especially in the Missouri. These things settled down, and all you had to do was walk up the stairs to the upper deck, and you're out of the water. And then the boats carried a couple yawls or small rowboats, and people might come and rescue. There's actually relatively little loss of life in most steamboat wrecks, because the boats just kind of settled to the bottom of a shallow channel, and there you were. And you kind of waited until help came along, or you slowly got shuttled to shore. So it really, these weren't like ocean wrecks where the ship is battered to pieces on the rocks or something like that. The big exception is boiler explosions. Um, and this goes back to a completely different engineering talk, but especially early on, you know, pre-1870 or so, there were no safety rules. There, were, there was every man for itself. There was no regulation. There was no safety. Um, steamboats routinely took shortcuts in safety. These are operating very high pressure boilers under very extreme conditions and maintenance was not always a factor in the profitability question. When a steamboat blew up, it blew up bad. And so injuries and deaths were quite common there because you're talking about releasing an extraordinary amount of scalded. People were scalded to death. They were horribly burned and disfigured. They were blown across the river. They were, you know, knocked unconscious or the ribs stove in. Um, when steamboats blew, it was horrible. In fact, if I recall correctly, Mark Twain lost a brother to a steamboat explosion. His brother was blown right off the boat and I think horribly burned and died in agony like a week later after being horribly burned. That was a pretty good example of the one way in which steamboat wrecks were pretty horrific. Um, oddly enough, to go back to the previous question, women were probably slightly more likely to survive a steamboat wreck because on most boats, the women's quarters and cabins were toward the back, toward the stern, and the boilers were at the front. So they were slightly more shielded from a boiler explosion. Uh, if you were a deck passenger, if you were an immigrant family, all bets are off. But if you were a higher paying female cabin passenger, you at least had a slightly better odds of not being killed in a boiler explosion. But the average steamboat wreck where it just kind of hit a snag and went down, yeah, you had a pretty good chance of surviving that. They were they were not that deadly in the way that people might think. All right. Um, we still have quite a few questions, um, some pretty good ones. So um, are, are you up for some more? I'm here as long as people want to listen. <laughs> okay. I've got my voice yet. I've got all night. Let's do it. <laughs> Those who are tired of my voice can sign right off, but I'm here for the questions. All right. Awesome. Um, Robert Foley said some boats were registered of Pembia on the Red River and traveled north to Hudson Bay and south on the Minnesota River to St. Paul. How did a boat? I'm not sure what this question is, to be honest. Um, he's asking, how did boats adapt here? Um, which I think you kind of answered. Yeah, there's, there's no overland route between here and Hudson Bay that a steamboat could navigate. Um, if the question is, how did boats adapt to other conditions beyond the Mississippi River Basin? It's certainly true that they did. Um, there's a whole separate history of steamboats on, say, the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, steamboating on the Yukon River in Alaska and the Yukon Territory is an absolutely fascinating history. I've actually been up there and I've actually explored steamboat wrecks on the Yukon River in Dawson City. 
the climate up there is so dry and cold that steamboats that were when the gold rush ended up there steamboats were just left to, to left on the bank and the climate preserve actually climbed around in the hulls of abandoned steamboats it's absolutely fascinating whereas down on this climate you know the heat and humidity they just rot away but there are still intact steamboat wrecks on the yukon river so you know you can go into steamboat history in many other places in fact Australia actually has a really interesting steamboat history of its own because most Australian rivers are actually a lot like the Missouri. They're dry, they're shallow, they're seasonal, but they were essential corridors into the Australian heartland. And my friends and contacts through the Nautical Research Guild that I communicate about steamboat stuff, there's a whole cadre of Australians in that organization that are fascinated with steamboat history with Australia's unique version of that. So, you know, these things developed first in the in North America in a lot of ways, but the technology spread rapidly all over the place and there are steam there were steamboats in africa and steamboats in china and if you want to go down this road you can find a global example of all the different ways these boats adapted to really unique situations so my focus here is on the missouri river but boy can you find steamboats everywhere and it's just it's absolutely fascinating yeah um <clears throat> brian pierce is wondering um what the impact of the civil war was on the use of missouri river steamers um, as opposed to those on the Ohio, Mississippi, and other more eastern rivers, um, especially in being forced or hired into military service. Yeah, so for the most part, the Civil War was a disaster for shipping interests along the Mississippi River Basin, because, especially in Mississippi, because the Confederacy closed the river uh, south, essentially south of St. Louis. And so... The entire river basin's economy was, you know, I mean, by river basin, everything from the Ohio River to the Mississippi to the Missouri, everything out here was aimed at shipping goods down to New Orleans for sale and transshipment. So when the Confederacy closed the river, steamboat traffic collapsed in a lot of cases. There were, you know, there was some local shipping up and down, say, the Missouri and on the, on the Ohio, but it was, largely it was an economic disaster. And a lot of boats, as the questioner suggests, were conscripted into military service by both sides. Um, as transports, as cargo carriers, there's a whole separate set of steamboats that were developed as armored steamboats. Many people may have heard of the gunboats like the USS Caro that's preserved at Vicksburg Military Park. But yeah, it really disrupted things. Um, you know, if the role of the Missouri River was to carry finished goods from the industrial Ohio River Basin out to the frontier west, well, that supply was cut off by the Civil War. If its role was to carry things like gold and agricultural products down the river to New Orleans, that route was also cut off. So yeah, it really disrupted things. Um, you know, a few people probably made out like bandits in certain shipping needs, but it really, really just was a giant blip. There's a sort of brief golden age of steamboating after the Civil War in which, you know, the economy opened up and everyone kind of got back to business um, before the railroads kicked in. So you had this really brief window post-Civil War pre-railroad where steamboating just went berserk on the Missouri River. And that's where actually the really profitable voyages were made. Those, you know, sixty to $80,000 voyages to Fort Benton and back were made in that golden, that brief golden age. And then it all kind of came crashing down. A fun alternate history is what would have happened if the Civil War had never happened. If steamboating had stayed vibrant and profitable for decades instead of being disrupted by the war, how different might that have made river traffic and settlement in the West without the effect of the Civil War? It's a really brief answer, but I hope that gets at something of the question. <clears throat> yeah, super, yeah, super fascinating. Um, Linda Vogt is wondering um, if you're familiar with the Corps of Engineers maps of steamboat wrecks on the Missouri River. Uh, I don't own one, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of wrecks along the river. Um, what way is the... Is the question more specific as to like how many wrecks? What is the question? What's the question? No, I, I think she's just sort of plumbing for, you know, thinking that might spur you into an interesting story. Um, I mean, I know that I've seen um, some of those maps. Um, there's one I use in talks a lot, which shows, oh, the last 45 miles of the Missouri River. And it's just literally just absolutely chock full of steamboat wrecks. The traffic, uh, it's a traffic jam of steamboat wrecks. Yeah, yeah. That was a particularly difficult stretch. And I imagine it was sort of like, okay, here we go. It's the Missouri River, you know, like, whoa, we didn't make it. Um, and several people have mentioned too, you know, that you, you were talking about the um, steamboat that had the boiler explosion at Lexington, Missouri. And 
and that that was the Saluda was the name of that steamboat and predominantly known for carrying um, Mormon immigrants actually from England and, and Wales, I believe, um, on their way to Utah. That was one of the, the main things that people um, on that ship were doing, uh, the passengers. Um, let's see, not totally sure what that means. Okay. Um, okay, so Bob Steyard is kind of curious. Um, like what was a daily log like for upper Missouri river steamboats? Like, was it like a bus with a schedule with a brief stop when they hit a town or something like that, or more like a steamer that might spend one to two days in port unloading gear and offloading passengers and stuff like that? That is a good and very complex question to answer because it varies so much from boat to boat. So, to a certain extent, we can talk about two different types of steamboat operations. There were what were called packets, and this is a term that goes way back to the sailing era, and that refers to a vessel that follows a steady regular route. So a packet might be in the St. Louis to, to Independence to Omaha service, and it's known that it leaves St. Louis every Tuesday at 10 a.m., and it arrives in independence at such and such a time and arrives in Omaha at such and such a time that it turns around and goes back in and does that same thing. So packet service was a reliable regular service, kind of like a bus service or a daily a daily freight on a railroad. So packet service was reliable, followed the same schedule, you know, river conditions allowing, but they were marketed as a steady service you count on for steady shipment, steady travel. Um, another alternative was more of the sort of independent contractor version uh, this is what in maritime shipping is called tramp, meaning that you just kind of go from port to port looking for cargo. So in this model, the steamboat basically just tries to sign up whatever cargo it can find and then takes off, sell that cargo up river and ship it river. So that steamboat might be sitting on a levee in St. Louis, you know, putting out handbills saying the steamer and so-and-so intends to head up to Fort Benton, leaving on, you know, April 10th, all, all cargoes accepted, all passengers accepted, contact the pilot for details. And it's just doing its best to consign cargoes to carry and anywhere along that route. We're making stops all the way along, you know, hop on board. So in that model, there is no schedule. It's simply heading to a final destination. It's trying to rustle up whatever cargo and business it can. If it shows up in Independence and it can rustle up 10 people that want to go to Fort Benton, hallelujah. You know, so that's a complete different kind of life because that kind of steamboat might sit around in a certain port waiting until there's enough business to go. Again, the uh, the tramp steamer idea, the tramp selling vessel in, in nautical freight is the same idea. So if you're traveling that way, you never quite know what it's going to do, but you, you at least know where it's going. So, and there's a lot of gray area in there. There were steamboats that were on regular government mail service. There were steamboats that were operating again on a military contract where they're doing whatever the army says they need done. You know, so... It really depends on what the boat's doing. And even if you're on a schedule, river conditions may affect it. It may have been a heavy thunderstorm. Let's say you're, you know, in the upper river, I don't know, somewhere in South Dakota, say. Let's say you're in Pier and you're waiting to continue up river. And let's say there's some really heavy thunderstorms on the plains and the river just rose two feet. Well, you might want to wait that out. Or you might take advantage. If the river's been low, you might take advantage. Nope, nope, we're leaving tonight. The river's going up. So the higher up the Missouri you get, the more conditions drive the schedule you can follow. So the more you're just going to have to grin and bear it and go with it. Um, mountain boats, another word with upper roads, went all the way to Montana. Sometimes they only made one trip per year. You might go up on the spring flood, stay up there for the summer, and come back down at the end of the year because a lot of your profit coming back down was carrying gold. And the gold miners wanted to wait to the last minute to head out. If you're trying to leave Montana and get out of the winter, you're going to wait to the last minute. So there's always kind of an interesting battle of... How long did you wait for miners and their gold before heading down, down river, but also risking, you know, the early October Plains blizzard? Versus if you left two weeks earlier for a safer trip down, you might miss out on that guy with $10,000 worth of gold in his poke who wants passage two weeks later. So you really, you know, these boats are adapting to the freight and the passenger conditions that they're up against. Uh, again, that's kind of a rambling answer, but it's, it's complicated. <laughs> it really depends on, on the situation. Well... Yeah, it's a complicated history for sure. Um, and such a, you know, time in, in, in this country, in this landscape where things are changing so fast um, that there's 
really knows one answer to a lot of these questions. Um, let's see. Oh, we have a friend who um, who helps out at the historic Herman Museum, um, and he's he was part of putting together the River Room, which, if I remember right, has the pilot house of a steamboat built right into the middle of it. It's a cool place, um, and he just said that he learned a lot and he's gonna add some of this info to his talks at the River Room. And one of the things he does is pretends to be um, uh, Captain Bill Heckman that you mentioned earlier. Um, that's kind of one of his shticks as well as uh, Mike Fink, um, but that's Gary Liebman and Herman. Um, so Matt Smith has this crazy story then he's looking for affirmation for so he said that he once read that um the sturgeon um so, so these would probably be the pallid sturgeon were so plentiful and large and easy to catch on the upper missouri river that steamboats used them for fuel have you ever heard that story that sounds like a missouri river tall tale to me you know that sounds like the kind of thing <clears throat> that was told to emphasize there's all sorts of tall tale stories like that you know there there's the uh, let me think how this goes the favorite one you know there's things like the, the missouri river it's too thin to plow and too thick to drink you know there's the stories of the upper river boats could you know you could the river was so dry the upper river boats had such a shallow draft you could tap a keg of beer off the bow and run for a mile in the suds you know Things like that were just a part of the patois, part of the the language of the upper river when people are out competing each other to tell tall tales. That to me just sounds like the kind of thing that gets passed down as a as a tall tale with a basis in fact, because the Missouri River Basin really was rich in resources and people wanted to portray just how rich those resources were and one of the ways to do that was to exaggerate. I mean, we all know fisherman stories. That sounds like a fisherman story to me. Um, well, I love it. I mean, because of, you know, what you said about, and when you go, when you go up there, um, how rare trees are and were, you know, um, and how they were required to move these boats. Um, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that can feed myths like this too. Um, I mean, who knows, there's, there might be a, a true story behind that. I love it. Um, and I'm going to start looking for stories about burning sturgeon. I mean, you know, I don't know, dry them out on the front deck for a while and you can light them off. I mean, there's um, probably, there's pro if you think about it, this is one of the factors I didn't mention, but those of us who use firewood know that it needs to be cured and it takes at least a year to cure firewood. These <laughs> boats weren't waiting a year to cure their firewood and they could only cut so much driftwood. So there's a good chance they were burning some green wood. And if you think that cured cottonwood doesn't have heat energy imagine burning green cottonwood i mean it's insane yeah but one of the things that really isn't covered in steamboat accounts is some of the details about operation like this like what happened if they burned green wood you know there, there's kind of two classes of resource about steamboat operation there's the stuff that's written by special specialists which is really technical and hard to access and there's stuff by written by people who were there at the time who took so much for granted that they often didn't include the details that we really want to know now. And so the specialists don't even know the details of exactly how much wood was burned and exactly what kind of wood was used and was it cut green or not, because we don't know. It'd be as if you were 200 years from now trying to write a story about <clears> some <throat> grocery store and you had to explain what a credit card was. You, you wouldn't even think to explain what a credit card was, but 200 years later, you might have no idea what a scene in the book means when someone pulls out a credit card and pays with it, because we just assume it. So there's a lot of these details I'd love to know more about, and I've not been able to really find utterly clear references in a consistent way on what did they do with some of this cottonwood? Like, was there enough driftwood to haul these steamboats, or were they throwing green cottonwood in there and burning, you know, 50 cords a day of ridiculous firewood that probably wasn't much better than a fish? <laughs> um, so this sounds like it might be a friend of yours. Uh, Mark Sundell just says, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, Mark Sendell, I don't know, I don't know. Um, wonderful talk farmhand, overly appreciated, greatly appreciated. So it sounds like there's an inside joke there somewhere. Um, but, uh, thank you. So I think all the rest of the questions that we have, let me take one more quick look. Um, 
<laughs> well, Rob Jacobson, who studies uh, pallid sturgeon, says pallid sturgeon are top predators, and so they were probably never that common. So there we go. Um, it's it's always good to have Rob on to set us straight. Um, so yeah, I think that um, really yeah, the rest of these questions I think are things you've already answered, and I know that you were um, also interested in showing a little more close-ups of your model, which um, obviously uh, not everyone's going to stick around for all of this, but it will be on YouTube um, if all of our stuff is working. <laughs> so, um, and I know there's still 35 people that are watching because it's so fascinating. So yeah, what we'll do here is give us a minute to transition. I'm going to sign over to my cell phone because I don't want to hold the laptop in front of these. It's just asking for damage. So just everyone who wants to kind of get a look at these, just bear with us for a minute while I, while I do this. And, and Eric, just ignore me, you know, do, do your work. But um, <clears throat> I mean, I just have to say, you know, from what we've seen so far, the photos that you show of your models being built, some of the interior pieces, um, some of the specialty work that you, that you did to show um, the structure, the inner structure, the skeleton of these boats is, is just absolutely amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and also to see one of the sailboats that you, um, that you also built, I imagine you've got more tricks up your sleeve. So Eric, just so you know, okay, great. We're seeing you now. All right, so is my screen, can you make, is this the screen people are seeing? Yeah, yeah. So right now we've got a horizontal screen, so that's perfect. And we're looking at the Bertrand and the Arabia. Can you, and you can hear me all right on this? Yep, we can hear you. Sounds good. Okay. So keep in mind that the Bertrand and the Arabian in real life were within 10 feet of the same length of each other. It's just the Bertrand's built in a smaller scale, so it looks cute and small, but they really should be the same size in real life. Uh, I don't know if people want to you know, comment on something they want to see in particular, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you guys nauseous here and there when I move stuff around, but I'm just going to kind of pan along the Bertrand here. This side of the model is built entirely open. So you can see and you can see all the framing of the interior. A little hard to get full light in there, but you get a sense of the framing. Yeah, there we go. The framing inside the model, it's based on the archaeological drawings. It's not exact, but it's close. So there actually would have been walls um, <clears throat> on the outside closing off what we're seeing in the interior here. Is that correct? Yep. And again, if I I can flip the model around in a minute. And you can see the, you know, the finished side. Oh, I see. Uh, someone, um, here's a question I was expecting that no one asked is how do you use the bathroom on these things? So on the Bertrand, at least, here's the heads. This little shack, notice it's hanging out over the paddle wheel. And the idea is that paddle wheel is your disposal unit. So, you know, if you look up in there, that's where it goes, right down to the wheel, right down in the river. And there's actually some someone going back to the question of what it was like to be a woman on a steamboat. Um, there are some stories that you had to be careful when they were doing repairs on the paddle wheel to keep women out of the heads, because otherwise it could be some very uncomfortable encounters if there's men on the paddle wheels and women in the heads. So that was, again, in their area where privacy was not really at a premium. But and on, the, on the heads, as far as I'm guessing, were on the paddle wheels as well, because that's really your best way to dispose of waste and kind of get it down on the river right away. There were probably heads on the main deck as well for use by the crew and uh, deck passengers, but we don't have good records of where those might've been because we don't have the superstructures. But uh, that's one that I thought people might want to know. Right. <laughs> if we turn the Bertrand around here, you know, here's a better view of how it looks off closed in, you know. Tiny amount of firewood, that amount of firewood is probably about an hour's worth, you know. Right. Yeah. That would run my house for two weeks, would run the bird train for about an hour. <laughs> There's that. I'm going to move the bird train aside here. 
And so Eric, um, what, what kinds of wood did you use in these uh, models? Uh, they're primarily uh, basswood, which is just a simple, simple, inexpensive, good wood for modeling. It's fine grained, it bends easily. It's kind of a cheap, basic choice for model builders. You, know, you can use higher end things like cherry if you're gonna leave the wood grain exposed, but I model suggest I'm painting them. So I'm not gonna you know, invest in cherry for that kind of thing. People who build high-end sailing vessels and want the wood to show will use much higher-end exotic woods, mahogany and cherry, and things like that. This is just basswood because it's it's strong and light and inexpensive and grows well. So just a quick panel on the Arabia, which has a lot more detail. And I'm going to flip this around in a minute too because this also has an open side. I don't know if this makes the grasshopper spars any easier to understand, but the three-dimensional view of them may help. So as far as you know, the Arabia had those grasshopper spars. We, yeah, we assume it did because it went up in Missouri. Um, it's shown that way in any, you know, in any illustrations. I just added them, assuming that anyone operating in the Missouri and certainly anything that went up the Yellowstone had to have effort. Um, so it's based on that. When I was designing this model. I based it in large part on a painting that the Arabia model commissioned by Gary Lucy of Arabia. And that painting itself is highly speculative since we actually have no idea what Arabia looked like above the main deck. But in, I made my own choices, where I, my own research suggested a different design, but it's based on the Gary Lucy painting that is, you know, the museum uses everywhere. So, you know, it's meant to represent the museum's idea of what the Arabia looked like. So that's one reason I chose to portray it the way I did. So, I'm gonna zoom in here on the machinery because people can often be interested in this. So here's a slightly better look. It's still hard to see, but a slightly better look in at the complex machinery in there. You saw this under development, but you know, again, just think about the poor stokers, often African-American working in the intense reflective heat right in front of those giant furnace stores stuffing this with wood. It's just, I don't like heat, I can't even imagine. But here's a view of the big paddle wheel. These things are huge and heavy. The weight of this thing hanging off the side of the boat is really something structurally. These little cabins here are probably something where heads might have been. Same thing with this one here. You can kind of see how it's hanging out into the paddle wheel area so your waist just kind of drops down on the river and doesn't bother anyone. Step the next boat downstream. And don't know how long people want me to go on doing this. I don't know if anyone has a specific thing they want to see or if this is enough just as a visual tour. Kind of open to suggestions as to what people want or don't want. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen any specific questions or um, comments, but um, just to be able to see all the different um, aspects has really been cool, for sure. Um, and what an amazing amount of work that you put in on these models. <clears throat> Don't know what else to add. I, mean, I could yammer on all night about you know technological details, but no one needs that. Well, if there's no one has any other questions. We can uh, suppose we. Can there. Well, thank you so much um, for all of your research. So, are, are you going to write a book? I mean, we're all wondering. Any publisher out there wants to talk to me about it? They can talk. About it. Okay, great. Word, but none of them, none of them really play with the combination combination of they're all either. I find there's two kind of books about the stuff. For the most part, there's either highly technical things that are only for people like me who can read their you know 300 page book on the details of steamboat engineering, or they're mostly cultural books that kind of take the details of the vessel for granted. There's a lot of good stories but they don't really delve deeply into how the boats were designed and why they did what they did and how that affected the landscape and so on. There is kind of a, there is an opening there to kind of talk about that, but uh, yeah, if anyone out there knows a publisher who wants to play on that project, sure, we'll talk. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, work with, I work on the plans. I've got that going for me. All right. Um, well, Eric, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your knowledge and um, all your research. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And we'll be, we'll be posting this video over the next day or two onto the Big Money Speaker Series website. Um, 
if you're interested, I may also ask um, to see if we could post your presentation there itself, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So have a great evening and thank you so much to everybody who tuned in today um, and uh, all of your really awesome questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I really appreciate everyone who took who took time out in the evening to be interested in this fairly esoteric. Obviously, it's fascinating to me, but it's it's rewarding to see anyone else be interested in this aspect of our regional history. So thank you all so much for being part of this. Awesome. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>